it's nice to greet you again as we gather together online for worship. As we begin today, I want you just to look around where you are just right at this point of time. You might be sitting at home on your lounge with family or friends around you or just on your own. You could be in your kitchen. You could be listening to this as you drive or maybe walking somewhere. Or you could even still be tucked up in bed nice and comfortably. But wherever you are, I want you to think about this. That place just right now is a place of worship. And we want to invite God into these moments that we share together just now. In Psalm 84, the writer has this longing for being in God's presence. And he writes this, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. And my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. There's this real desire within the writer to be in God's presence, possibly in a place of worship, but more so in God's presence and knowing God with him. He goes on to write in verse 10, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Wherever you are just now, that is a place of worship. We don't go to a holy place. A holy God comes to any place where his people are and he meets with us. And that's what we want to do this morning. Meet with a holy God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Well, this year has been a very different year for all of us. There's been lots of changes that have come about this year. I wonder whether you've taken time to consider what those changes have really meant for you and the way that you live life. During this past week, our band have been able to recommence rehearsals, socially distancing, of course. Uh, But as they were around on Wednesday night, I asked a few of the guys to consider or to answer a couple of questions for me. Firstly, what have you learnt to value more during these days? And secondly, what have you discovered isn't as important now as what it once was? We're going to listen to the answers that uh, some of the guys gave. And I wonder whether at the end of this, you might want to pause this video. And if you have people there with you, you might want to discuss this for yourselves, answering those two questions. Or maybe you want to uh, leave a comment in the uh, comment section of our YouTube channel. Or you can jump online to uh, our, either our Facebook page or our website and leave a comment there about these two questions. Uh, value, that's a hard one. It's a toss-up between toilet paper and porcelain cups, but um, I really value porcelain cups. There's only so many coffees you can have in a takeaway cup, um, but yeah, porcelain cups really enhance the flavour. Uh, so what I've found important over the time is probably catching up with friends and family uh, and going out for exercise. I definitely have uh, found that to keep my morale up going out in the afternoons with the family, going for a walk, seeing the sunset. It's, it's a nice way to end the day. So I have learnt to value in this time that people, connecting to people face to face is important. Uh, as much as, as technology is great, seeing people is good. Uh, for me, I've really just found that uh, community is really important. Uh, to stay connected uh, spiritually, but also with others um, to be able to encourage each other in your faith. I've realised the importance of family and taking time to just check on everyone, make sure they're okay. Took that for granted a lot. Um, It's an interesting question. I think what's important or has been important through this time is to be uh, much more intentional with your existing relationships. Um, It's easy for some of them to kind of fall off a little bit if you're not um, pursuing people that are close to you and perhaps not that close to you as well. Um, So what's been important is really setting aside time and and, and quality time um, for those conversations that um, perhaps, yeah, were quite fleeting before, um, but have, uh, yeah, over this you know, recent period of actually developed and grown stronger because I have set us on that time. So that's been something that's been really important. I think what I've discovered is that it's important that we keep the contact up, even though we can't meet, that we keep the contact up and support each other. I found out particularly with the family, um, the ones that are away, um, they used to, we used to talk about once a week, but now we're talking every day because they're working from home, they're not meeting, don't have their social interaction. And so it's important that we support each other even though we can't meet. Yeah, so what I've found important is just like the interaction with people, like just having coffee or just hanging out with people. I've, I felt like that's been really important um, during this time. In the past few months, I have valued good health and the use of technology to both communicate and to be informed. Ironically, probably time on social media. Um, I think I've realised that I've spent too much time on it in the past to try and fill time, and now that I'm just getting bored on it. So I think the more that I cut back on it, the more I can actually do with my day, which is, which makes sense, yeah. Um, I think the daily routine um, each week um, of what we, I guess, fill with it um, hasn't been as important as uh, slowing down, actually taking time for yourselves, but also taking time with God. Uh, Probably like the time that I spend on my phone, like I kind of take that like for granted, like how much time I spend on my phone normally. So at the moment I'm spending even more time. So that's something that I feel like is not as important as it used to be. I always thought um, being busy was important. It's over the last few months I've discovered that um, it's it's not really important at all to, to constantly feel every um, every moment of your life is something it's probably been yeah the news and, and social media it's been um 
you know, very uh, virus driven and, and, you know, a lot of things focused on that. And um, after a while, you, you know, you follow the rules and, and do the right thing, right? But um, become very overwhelming. So uh, over this period of time, I've actually been trying to turn that off a little bit and um, it's probably made for a healthier um, mindset. Um, and a healthier well-being. So I can say, yeah, probably um, the news and all those different outlets turning that off has, um, has made it better. It hasn't been very important at all for me, which has been good. I think the thing that sticks out in my mind is the, the reliance on travel. The vast amount of travel that we, we do, or that I used to do, but with a lockdown environment, uh, we, I, I no longer do, and I find it painful to, to have to travel um, across the other side of town. The routine, like routines change and I've learned to realise that change is not a bad thing when it comes to routine. It's the, um, the, the meat of everything that happens around it. I've realised that keeping busy isn't as important as I thought it was. I used to take time and oh, I need to keep myself busy, I need to be doing something all the time. But um, yeah, it's nice to just take a step back and relax and take everything in. I guess one of the things is um, we don't have to be so busy. Um, in our worship and in our lives, uh, we can step back and, and um, take time to reflect and, um, and think about things. I've really enjoyed receiving the um, devotions each week in, in the emails, taking the time to read and listen to the musical messages rather than the rush at band practice uh, when someone gets up to speak. Um, so I think that reflection time um, I think is important as well. Um, I used to think, you know, rushing about on Sunday, um, it was always busy and it was something we had to do, but uh, I'm thinking that maybe we need to relook at some of that busyness in our lives um, on Sunday and throughout the week. someone who is easily distracted. Distractions are all around us. You know what I mean? You sit down to focus on an activity, but before you know it, your mind has wandered off somewhere else and you're thinking about or doing something completely different to the task you started to do. Our digital online world makes it very easy to get distracted and to focus on something else. While we're at work, at home, out with people, it is so easy to become distracted. Jesus knew about distractions and he warned his disciples to guard against them. His focus was on the distractions that are possible and can cause us to lose focus or not be as connected to God as we need to be. Today, we need this warning as our lives are so full of activity and things that tempt us not to give God or his will in our lives our full attention. Over the past few weeks through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we've talked about how we can become distracted in our worship of God. Jesus warned against doing spiritual things for the sole purpose of being noticed. Our giving, our prayer life, and even fasting, those things in themselves are good spiritual practices and they're important aspects in deepening our relationship with and worshipping God. But if they're done from a heart that desires to be noticed by others, then we've allowed them to become distractions. The focus has gone from worshipping God to being all about us and people looking at us and believing that we are very spiritual. A deep spiritual relationship with God puts all the focus on God. It draws people to notice God. It happens in the heart of a person who gives God all the glory. 
Another place that we often seek to receive our affirmation, value, and identity from is our possessions or our wealth. And Jesus also says that this is an area of distraction and it has the potential, if we let it, to take our focus off God as we're tempted to find security and satisfaction in earthly things instead of what we already have in our relationship with God in heavenly things. The big question that has come out of the Sermon on the Mount for me so far personally is the question of where my heart is. I've been challenged to evaluate if my heart is seeking after myself or after a real vibrant relationship with God. And I've also questioned what am I allowing in my life to distract me from God? Today's reading from the New Testament comes from Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. May God bless that reading to our understanding this morning. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you know there's a lot of things competing for your heart and your attention? Why? Because your heart is the control center of your life. And as disciples, we're not immune from the distraction or temptation to chase after the things of the world, to treasure earthly things and put more time and attention into those things rather than the things of God. What are some of the things you're tempted to treasure? The latest fashion or technology? Success in business? Early retirement? A lovely home? A perfect family? Ageless skin or a perfect body? Or power and control over circumstances or others? What is it that you think about or focus on or believe is crucial to your sense of livelihood or happiness? You know, for something to be a treasure, it must have value attached to it. Not just in the monetary sense of value, but in how precious it is to you and how much time and effort you put into acquiring, maintaining and keeping that treasure. Some of the treasures that you thought about earlier may not necessarily be bad things, the things that are important to you. But if they distract you or keep you from deepening your relationship with God, or if you rely on those things to satisfy or give you value or affirm your identity, then they can become bad. When we believe and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, then we call God our Heavenly Father. And he gives us our true identity and he affirms our value. And he is the only one that we should be seeking those things from. Jesus wants us as his disciples to be careful about what we're treasuring. And he encourages us to focus on the things of eternity, the things of God, the blessings that God has for us, the things that are permanent and will not pass away or be destroyed like the treasures of earth that we're tempted to build up. We've certainly been reminded this year of the temporary nature of earthly treasures through both the bushfires and coronavirus. Whether it's wealth, beauty or power, earthly treasures are transient and they're susceptible to change. Our wealth doesn't guarantee happiness, security or long life. 
Suddenly all that we have treasured on earth can, and in many cases has been so easily taken away. When we're living the way God has called us as his disciples to live, when we're following after him in all that we do, loving our neighbor as ourselves, being cheerful givers, honoring God in our relationships and marriages, when we're guarding our minds against adulterous thoughts, when we're sharing the good news of the gospel with others, then we're treasuring heavenly things. When riches or earthly things are the focus of our lives, our vision becomes distorted. When the things we can see outweigh the eternal things that are unseen, we have spiritual nearsightedness. Do you know loving earthly riches can create spiritual blindness? It can cause us to not see the truth, the will of God for our lives correctly. It distorts our vision and it causes us to not see God as clearly as we maybe once did. I wonder, are you missing God's best for you and stumbling through life because of unhealthy spiritual sight? Do you have an unhealthy preoccupation with the things of the world, which is actually clouding your vision of God and his will for your life? Jesus actually concludes this passage by saying, no one can serve two masters. You know, you cannot have two things vying for first place in your life. What you treasure is, in a very real way, your master. And Jesus is saying that you can't have two masters. We can't set our eyes on two things or have two centers or two treasures that we devote ourselves to. Attempting to serve two masters will actually result in our coming to resent or despise or resist one or the other. People often think that they can have the best of both worlds, but disciples of Jesus have only one master, God. We can't serve money and God. We can't serve popularity and God. We can't serve ourselves and God. We can't serve our families and God. We can have only one master. Jesus is challenging us to look at the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. He's challenging us to repent, to change our mind about earthly treasures, about the things that perhaps we once served, and to serve him only. God is calling us to a radical life of service to him as our master. There is such huge importance in us realizing that God is our father and we are his children. God will take care of us and provide for all our needs as he sees fit. But the temptation of us to hold on to earthly things weighs heavy and it tempts us to trust our riches or our things on earth instead of our heavenly father. As disciples, we remember that all we have and are is because of God. We have obtained nothing by ourselves. All earthly things are not ours to own or to keep. We're stewards. We are to use what God has given us here on earth to bring glory to him and for his purpose. So we can't make those things, whether they are money, family, possessions, to build up our kingdom. We're to use them to build God's kingdom, to help others know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, and to discover God's blessings and plans for their life. Jesus wants all of our heart. He desires that we have an intimate relationship with the Father just like he does. We can't serve God and the riches on this earth. It just doesn't work. One is despised or hated, while the other is loved and followed. And whichever one you serve, that's the one that becomes your master. If it's riches, those riches are your master. They have control over you. If it's God, your father, then he is your master. He has control over you. So a big question today is, who are you serving? Now, I don't know where your heart is. 
or what your heart is longing for or serving. Only two people know that, you and God. I know that if you're serving yourself by storing up wealth or popularity or whatever it may be, that it will actually come to an end. It's only temporary. But if you are serving God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, you won't be disappointed. Our first priority is God and his kingdom. And as we chase after that, we trust that he will meet our daily and future needs. Where is your treasure? What or who have you given your heart to? What are you allowing to distract you as a disciple of Jesus living the 167? Who are you serving? I pray that you are serving God the Father and him alone. I want to lead you in a time of responding to God. Matthew 6, 21 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Meditate on the truth of those words for yourself. Allow them to fill you with a desire to surrender your life fully to God's plans and God's love. As you've looked at this passage today, what has the Holy Spirit revealed to you about the ways you are laying up treasure here on earth? Where are you seeking fulfillment and provision from the world rather than from God? What parts of your life are not God's best for you? What are you chasing after? Confess those aspects of your life to God now and, and take time to receive his forgiveness. It's important to acknowledge that you've been putting other things in the number one spot of your life, the spot that is meant for God alone. Let's pray together. God, today I surrender to you my life. I acknowledge where I have put other things in the number one spot in my life, where I'm not chasing after you, where I'm actually serving myself rather than you. God, I confess today my sin of doing that and I ask for your forgiveness. I thank you, God, that you have given me all that I need, that you have entrusted to me those things that I can use to help others find you, to discover Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Today, I give you my heart, I give you my will. I trust in you, God, for your plans for my life, for the riches that you have for me that are eternal. I pray, God, that uh, as I surrender to you today, that I will acknowledge you as Lord and Saviour of my life. Amen. Now we're going to uh, just have a song that you may like to sing or you may like to just listen to as you continue to pray and meditate on this passage. All to Jesus I surrender. Are those words, words that you can say today? Are they words that you need to re-say today? That again today, God, I surrender everything that I am to you. Because God, I want to serve you first and foremost. I want to build my life on your treasure, not on anything that the earth has to offer. So today I choose to surrender my all to you.